Welcome to Business Better, a podcast designed to help businesses navigate the new normal. I'm your host, Steve Burkhardt. After a long career at global consumer products company, BIC, where I served as Vice President of Administration, General Counsel, and Secretary, I'm now Special Counsel in the Litigation Department at Bowers Bar, a law firm with clients across industries and throughout the country. In today's episode, we're joined by Greg Nodlin, CEO, and Michael Ferkovic, Vice President of Business Development at Ridgemont Equity Partners portfolio company, Sunvera Group. Sunvera Group is a management services organization dedicated to providing first-rate management and administrative solutions to ophthalmology practices across multiple subspecialties. Leading this discussion is my Bowers Spar colleague, Jeffrey Fickus, co-leader of the Private Equity Group. So now let's turn the conversation over to Jeff. Good morning, everybody. My name is Jeffrey Fickus. I'm a partner of Ballard Spar and the co-leader of the firm's national private equity practice. This morning, I have wonderful guests, Greg Nodlin, who's the CEO of Sunvera Group, which is a portfolio company of Ridgemont Equity Partners. And along with him, I have Michael Ferkovic, who is the uh, vice president of business development, also of the Sunvera Group. So with that, Tell me about yourself and your role with Sunvera. Greg, why don't you kick us off? Thanks for the introduction. As the CEO, I joined uh, in 2018, and that was the initial investment of Bridgemont when uh, they stepped into the ophthalmology space. Uh, prior to that, I've, I've been working with private equity since about 2008 in a management capacity, um, previously in the dental field, and have had experience with, you know, at this point, five different PE firms. Um, through my career. And um, as the role of CEO, it, obviously I'm leading the organization, uh, but it's also really just to try to harness, you know, what we, the opportunities in the market, work with the team to identify our strategic mission, our goals, working with the doctors, make sure we understand the environment and, uh, you know, drive the business forward. Um, ultimately it's, you know, it is an investment and we're trying to maximize shareholder value, but there's just a, it's just a manner in which you do it. There's, it doesn't necessarily have to be profits at all costs or, you know, driving things, you know, through just tough operations. I think that there's, you know, healthcare is a sensitive area and I think that there's huge opportunities here. So, you know, that's really what, what my role is here. Fantastic. How about you, Michael? Jeff, thanks for having us and the opportunity to talk a little bit more about what we're doing. So I joined Sunvera Group in October 2021. Um, Greg and I actually knew uh, a lot of folks uh, from our prior lives in the dental space. I actually came from public accounting in the financial diligence world. We started talking over time and, and realized this was a great opportunity to get to the other side. So rather than just doing diligence, flip to the other side, learn from Greg, learn from our team, learn from Ridgemont. And also just listen to our doctors too. And I, I think one of the things that we want to get across today, and we try to drive home both with our team members at the MSO level, is that we're really trying to be in service to our doctors. So while my day-to-day role is is from sourcing all the way to deal making, closing, and assisting in the integration piece as well, really what we're trying to do is listen to our doctors. They are our providers, they're our revenue source. And really, you know, they're folks that we go to day to day. I'm, I wear glasses and, you know, consider myself a patient. And we want to make sure that we're providing the best environment for them to meet their goals, whatever they may be uh, within the ophthalmology field. Well, you, you raise a good point. I was going to mention kind of jokingly that neither of you happen to be physicians unless there's something about your educational and professional backgrounds that I'm not aware of. Um, so with that, tell me how you why you chose this field and how you've evolved and how Sunvera Group, the platform for this eye care physician practice management company, has evolved. I got into ophthalmology largely for the opportunity, the situation because you know it's, it's Detroit-based and I wanted to stay in the Detroit market from a 
lifestyle perspective. Um, I love the state of Michigan and everything. And as I got into ophthalmology, it's been an amazing experience. I think it's a phenomenal field of healthcare. Um, you have a very, very high satisfaction rate from the doctors. I, I have yet to meet an ophthalmologist who doesn't love what they do. And I don't know that that's necessarily the case in um, every healthcare profession or, you know, physician uh, vertical. Um, you're, you're, you've, got a, you've got patient care, you've got surgical care, you've got continuity of care where you're really trying to help people for something. We, we talk all the time about saving and restoring sight. I mean, that's a common thread that goes throughout our organization. Sight is one of our five senses and it's something you don't want to lose. And so it's really, really important to our patients and our doctors take that very seriously. And just, I think there's a high level of satisfaction there. And it really helps having that type of mission when you're trying to drive you know, business, because that's ultimately what we are trying to do. But at the same token, there's a very altruistic common theme that we're trying to, you know, drive through the organization, which is saving our source site. We talk about all the time and how everybody impacts that in the patient experience. And a lot of times in private practice, that doesn't always come through all the time and people lose sight of things. And that's kind of where we step in here is trying to reinvigorate the doctor to help the doctor through all the different challenges that they have, create an environment in which they can be successful and deliver the care that they have. Um, so it's a very satisfying area of healthcare to be in. Um, it's got its challenges like anything else in healthcare, but it, it's been very good so far. That's interesting. How about you, Mike? How, how did you get into it and how have you evolved during your tenure being a non-physician? Not just Greg and, and myself too. We, we, a lot of us within the corporate, uh, service center come from public accounting I was kind of the odd duck in my family in that I got into accounting. So most of my family is in some form of healthcare service. Half my, my family was, went either went into teaching. The other half was a group of pharmacists, my parents, sister, physical therapist, grandmother, nurse, um, cousins who are pharmacists and, and down the, down the road too. One of the, the bigger questions was why, why did he even get into accounting in the first place? And, and part of it was as I think healthcare and we had these dinner table talks, you get into the financials and what's driving healthcare. I was just a fly on the wall because I was a kid and I didn't know what I was doing <laughs> and ultimately decided that public accounting might be an opportunity to learn the language of business and serve whatever I was going to do. Now, as that evolved over the years from audit to financial diligence, I just started doing more and more healthcare and certain family members would pull me aside and say, Hey, didn't we scare you off from this <laughs> as well? And I think what ultimately that, that came about. And as I, I worked with clients from prior life and met Greg is we're really here to be just of service too. And we try to emphasize that when we have our conversations with our doctors of, I am not a doctor. I was not trained to be a doctor. Patient care decisions are up to them. And we don't want to interfere with that other than providing some financial discipline analysis and guiding a conversation in a manner that can make them successful for what, whatever their goals might be. Um, so if you kind of look at it from a, a, a standpoint of let's make sure that the numbers are telling a story and let that story help us make a better decision moving forward or whether that's you know getting to a deal or a, us helping them manage the business beyond that's what we're in service here for. I am not the show. And really, my name should never really kind of come up in terms of, you know, the good or the bad of the deal making. But we're really just trying to be in service to those doctors and with their branding, with what they're, they want to take their, their, um, their practice to the next level for whatever that might be, draw that out of them and, and truly be of, of service to them in some, in some manner. Well, Mike, uh, I've known you for a long time through Cleveland chapter of ACG. And that was one of the things I was always impressed, that always impressed me about you, was that as a CPA, um, you understood that you had a certain area of expertise, but it was all about in service to others, the clients, and it wasn't about you. And I've always tried to model my legal practice the same way. Uh, we have tools in a tool belt, but they're only valuable if someone wants to use them. Uh, and pay for our time and our our uh, services. So thanks for that that perspective. And I'd also mention the the mission that you stated about. Greg, can you say it one more time? Saving and restoring sight. Yes, that's it exactly. Um, you know, most of us are are you know fairly lucky in that um, you know we don't have serious eye disease as young people. 
but I've had, I've been myopic since I was about 10 years old. So I've been going to, um, an eye care professional my whole life essentially. And, and so have other members of my family, but I noticed as my parents who are both 75 years old and older, you know, they're in the demographic where their sight uh, becomes more critical to their independence as they age. And they start to like with other areas like heart and whatnot, sight is, is critical to their independence yet they're starting to face, um, you know, issues with their sight that most elderly people will face uh, if they're lucky to live long enough, whether it be cataracts or blurred night vision or et cetera, et cetera. So they both spend a lot more time at the uh, with eye care professionals than they ever did when they were younger. So I see how valuable and I see why that mission is so valuable. Tell me a little bit more about Sunvera Group at a high level and its relation and, and about Ridgemont equity partners and the relationship and how did the initial platform investment come about and what's been the growth since? So, um, you know, Ridgemont is, uh, they're a great partner. They are, um, have a lot of healthcare experience. And I think that really does matter as people think about, you know, private equity, there's, there's a wide spectrum of investors. I mean, and yeah, I think it's important that, I mean, I guess you always have your first healthcare investment, but it's important to have somebody who has good healthcare experience and understands it because it's a people business more than, eh, it's hard for me to say, I don't know other industries as well, but literally the people who are producing the revenue and driving your financial success are people and people have challenges in life and you have to have that understanding about that. So, you know, Ridgemont has been a great partner. They really, they did a lot of investigation or, or, you know, into different fields and they knew they wanted to get involved in ophthalmology. And so they were constantly, you know, looking at different platforms and things. And then they were fortunate enough to um, invest in a group here in the Detroit market. And so the initial business was four doctors, four MDs, DOs, and as well as a OD. Um, and it was a nice platform. And so when we came in, you know, really trying to you're really start building an MSO from scratch. There really isn't a lot there. And over time, you know, we had to build the identity of Sunvera, identify, you know, build, we had a name that literally came up with the name Sunvera. Then we have to build, you know, what's important, what's going to be our strategic vision, and then start building from there. And then over time, we've, um, you know, there were some hiccups along the way. I mean, as you get into a, into, an, into an industry, it's a discovery, especially if you're not necessarily specifically uh, understand or know ophthalmology, there's a steep learning curve. But as we as we progressed, we really started to understand where the value that we can bring to the table is. We knew that inherently that it, when there's consolidation, there's opportunity, but understanding those specific items, we got more and more refined about how we felt we could make a difference with partnering with practices. And then, you know, COVID hit. So that was kind of a bear of an issue to deal with. But really coming out of that, you know, bringing Mike on board and really getting the, the business development area going, we've been, been able to grow from those five original doctors up to 45 providers at this point in time. And, you know, it's not necessarily just become megalomaniacs and grow. We truly feel that there's a purpose for what we're doing in the industry within the consolidation. You know, there's going to be good and bad players. There's, you know, hospitals are consolidating as well. It's just everywhere. So we're just trying, you know, finding where we can fit in there, bring value to the doctors that we're bringing on board and provide services. Um, it, it's, it's really been, uh, it's been, been an evolution for sure. And we've, you know, every every year though, we come up with new things and identify different ways because the market moves on you or technology changes. And but it's really been uh, an evolution for sure. How do you see your your strategy and vision differing from other eye care platforms? You know, it's hard for me to really say. I think inherently we all have the base business model, which is build an MSO, bring those services that the doctor may not otherwise want to handle, and you know, grow through M and A. Um, but the second caveat to that is you also want to grow organically. You know, our approach is, is, and it's, again, I can't really speak to how other people are building their models, but our approach is we want to build a model to support the doctor for them to practice the manner in which they want to practice. We're not prescriptive in saying you have to see X number of patients. You have to do X, Y procedures. You have, your patient flow has to go this way. Every doctor's had an independent way of managing it. And really there's no right or wrong. Way. We're, we want to we want to bring things of value to them that they maybe would not have invested in, 
or they aren't really paying attention to and, and not seeing the value to it. Can you so give me an example? At our approach is, doctor, you practice the way you practice. We want to support you there. Um, and, you know, generally everybody has the same role. I mean, they want to take care of their patients. Um, and there's just a bunch of different ways to do that. And so there's some things we can, for lack of better terms, standardize. Um, but there's some things you just want to stay the heck away from. Um, and, and we work with the doctors. One of the things that we, we, I think we pride ourselves on is the fact that we think, you know, we're good listeners. We like, to, we, we don't come in there and think we know everything. Um, so first, you know, observe, understand what's the situation and then come in with the answers. Sometimes doctors are expecting us to come in and do a bunch of different things immediately. And we're like, slow the roll guys. Let's just figure out what's going on before we make a mistake. I, I can elaborate on it a little bit uh, as well. So to, to give an example, I mean, we, we set this up so that we are Midwest and we've refined that a little bit over the last year to say Great Lakes. So we're really trying to keep a very tight geographic focus. That's Detroit, that's Cleveland, now Erie. We're looking really just in, in a few number of states here. And then to pro- provide depth of the subspecialty. So you know, I, I mentioned previously jumping from the public accounting side to this side too. Once you get into ophthalmology, as well. It's amazing how pervasive the services are. And then you kind of pull it back to onion a little bit as well. And you realize just how networked ophthalmologists are too. So if you look at a comprehensive ophthalmologist, by their very nature, they are referring out glaucoma, retina, perhaps peds. Um, You can go down the line here as well. And that actually provides a huge opportunity for us because if you look at the geographic density that we're trying to build here, all these guys know each other. They're working with each other in some way. And whether we can align the financial incentives up to just by putting the deal together or not, a lot of our doctors are very mission driven on they want to make sure that those referrals continue in what, the best manner to get the best results for their patients as well. Again, we're just trying to here to serve them. And if we can set it up in a manner that makes it work financially for them, as well as achieving those qualitative goals, we're going to try to do that. Um, and, and just by keeping it tight geographically, too, I would just say the Midwest culture, Great Lakes culture, however you want to phrase it, um, makes it, I, I think, much easier to manage, too. Um, whether we're a community of, you know, talking about our sports teams or whatever it might be <laughs> um, in, in this geographic area as well, we all kind of know each other. And it's a small backyard, small, small world. Sheer misery on our poor football teams. <laughs> That's right. It's a friendly rivalry. Anything you, you want to add, Greg, to the how you support doctors uh, strategically with respect to organic growth? Again, you know, listen to them, understand what their hopes and dreams are, where the opportunity is. Um, you know, one of the things that we, we have found is that, that there's a lot of chronic care in ophthalmology. You know, I, I came from the dental world where the most important thing you had was your recall, which is to, to keep the hygiene going. And that's just because it's just a, it just becomes an engine there. I, I think so, when, in ophthalmology, it's just not as focused on it as much, meaning they don't have good technology to re- outreach you know, have outreach to their patients, making sure that there's no patient left behind, which is literally a term we use internally is that no patient is left behind. It all comes back to saving and restoring sight. If a person has glaucoma, they have high pressure in their eyes, but they feel fine. But the reality is they're going blind slowly. And as an example, we have lots of technology that we hook into our practice management system to ensure that we have touch points with those patients to try to get them back in. I mean, there's, you know, there, of course, there's a business reason because you're keeping your schedules full. But at the same token, it's helping us fulfill our mission to save and restore sight. The patient is going blind. They need to come in and get the treatment. And it's just like anything else, you know, it doesn't hurt. Now, like in dentistry, that was always a thing. But in glaucoma, it doesn't, they don't notice it, but they're slowly going blind. And so that's an example of something that we help the doctors. Some doctors are great at it. Some doctors are completely ignoring it. They're not seeing the treasure trove of patients where there's, hey, I'd like to see more patients. I'm like, you've got thousands of patients in your database that you aren't necessarily actively trying to bring back in. And we, that's one of the things that we will help them focus in on. But again, it's really coming, listening to them, what they want when they, you know, as soon as they open that door and say, Hey, I want to see more patients. It's like, Hey, let's, let's talk about that. Let's talk about how we can bring marketing in if that's what you want. But it's, you know, let them separation of church and state. They can be the church and they're taking care of the patients and we're handling this, these support things to make sure that we 
help them fulfill what they're trying to accomplish. We have a, a slide that we show all the time. And right at the top of the slide, at the top of the pyramid is the patient. The middle is the providers. And us at Sunvera, we're on the bottom. And that's our, we're, we're a service organization servicing our doctors. Our doctors are taking care of our patients. And we constantly hammer that home to people within our organization that that's the paradigm. Patient is the most important. We're supporting our doctors and we're here to support them, not the reverse. And I think a lot of organizations, as they grow and, you know, get bigger, they lose sight of that. They get so enamored with the organization and their roles that they forget why they're there. And, you know, I can't say we're huge. I mean, we have 500 team members. But we're bigger than a 30-person practice. Uh, but we constantly remind and keep that top of mind that you know, don't get too big for your britches and make sure we're focusing on what's important. That's a great philosophy for business and life. And ties with what Michael was saying earlier as well. So tell me a little bit about your success to date. You know, your, your partners, how you've improved physician lives, how you've improved patients' care. So just trying to keep with the theme here, too. Certainly, we have M&A growth. We have organic growth, too. But just to use some examples of things that we, we've tried to do with even our initial platform as a, as a case study, the ability to add providers at a physical location and thereby see more patients, perhaps closer or whatever the, the case might be for that individual patient is a way that we we try to pride ourselves on the overall growth. So certainly we want to grow inorganically through that M&A and then build that depth of services in whatever markets we're in too. But more so, I, I think where we take a lot of pride is, are we executing on the plan that we laid out um, when we put the, the overall deal together? If we can do that, we're, we're going to see a lot of success moving forward. And then a lot of what I do day to day in terms of deal sourcing becomes easier because I have an advocate in that doctor to say, Hey, these guys did what they said they were going to do. And then they can go describe it within that network and obviously makes the deal sourcing a lot easier there as well. So, you know, things like that in terms of the organic growth, and then obviously just paying attention to overall technology too. So building off of, of uh, the examples um, that, that Greg provided earlier in terms of mining the technology to for patient recall. Um, you know, I think there's a misconception in healthcare that one way, the only way to grow is to become more reliant on self-pay and the latest technology, uh, getting away from Medicare and Medicaid and, and those types of things. That not that's not necessarily true. And and when we go in and talk to these doctors, they know their community and they know their patient base way better than we do. So um, even if I'm in Cleveland working with our doctors here locally, they know the little sub community they've been serving for a long time and premium lenses are, are becoming bigger in this industry, but that's not something that we're going to push. So if you look at our, our range of doctors, we have doctors that do very few of those premium lenses, which are self pay other doctors that are very much more comfortable with that as well. And it's really up to them in terms of how they want to design their plan for their office. Again, we're here to facilitate that, show them the data behind it. If that is something that they want to pursue um, and then move forward and, and support them in whatever that game plan might be. That's excellent. How do you improve? You know, we're going to get to, you know, what are the type of eye care practices that would be good fits uh, to partner with Sunvera? But those that have partnered with you so far, how have you improved their lifestyles, whether it's, you know, uh, work life balance um, or, you know, their financial? situation from a from a risk uh net worth or an income perspective i think all the above i mean um certainly there's a financial aspect to it um, because we are investing in their business and buying essentially the future cash flows of the business um you know from an improvement perspective there's the obvious which is we do remove the headaches of having to deal with all the employment laws dealing with healthcare laws and compliance and things like that. But further to that, we are a resource center for them. And I think a lot of times you get the comment that they just like having that HR support to bounce things off of, or they, you know, from a compliance perspective that we're reviewing, we have a, a billing reviewing process to ensure that they're not doing anything untoward. And nobody really, it's just the, the billing is complicated and, you, you know, you don't know if you're doing it right. We have a process internally where we, re, we review billing and, and uh, claims and whatnot, just make sure that they're 
properly supported and things like that. So I think that, you know, most of the sentiment that I get is they, and they like being part of a team. They like the camaraderie of the other doctors that are part of the organization. They like the collaborative approach that we have, not necessarily just in helping them run their practice, but also we're collaborative within the community. It's like, if you have a doctor who's a LASIK doctor, we're willing to go and put, we have, you know, within all of our offices, we have TVs and we can run closed loop advertising, so to speak. We can promote their practice and their LASIK practice internally, you know, so that's, it's just collaborative from that perspective. So I think that there's, um, again, there's a financial aspect. Um, there are now our partner because they're all invested in our business. And so we have a, you know, they want to see our organization grow and get better, have a good reputation. We take those administrative headaches off, which is always, you know, what everybody talks about. But I think there's also that sense of community and that support level that they get that they really value. How about aspects of uh, CapEx? You know, the equipment that uh, eye care professionals use is very expensive and I'm sure only getting more expensive. How, how do you help assist your physician practice partners with those things to, to assist with their organic growth, to make sure they have the latest and greatest eye care technology? Well, if you're talking growth, we're, we're quick to spend on those dollars. I mean, it's, it's a no brainer. If somebody needs, if there's a bottleneck or they're going to open a new facility, we're all about trying to help them grow there. I think if it's a practice that's, you know, pretty steady, we have the same limitations on CapEx that they had. So it's not like we can just come in and pour money into it. But we'll also, you know, talk to the doctors about what they might want to invest in. So a couple of recent examples we've had is one of our doctors, it's an oculoplastic, which is really they work around the eyes and the muscles and things, but they're also very natural as far as doing cosmetics. And he wanted an IPL laser. And he felt that, hey, we could build a practice around the IPL laser. So we talked about it and we... Did, they, they did all the investigation or the study, looking into it to understand, you know, what's the best laser, what's the cost. We built a, helped them build a business model around it. We hired a PA in to help execute it, and off we go to the races. Um, you know, another doctor wanted an osmolarity test, which is, um, I'm not quite sure it is, what it is, honestly. However, <laughs> at the end of the day, we, we, we helped them with the, with the uh, building the break even on that particular one to understand, you know, is it going to be something that they're going to be using in the, in the, in the field. So it, it's, it's not like it's a, you know, carte blanche to go out and buy whatever you want. We've got deep pockets where we have our same limitations that they have, but at the same token, we're a hundred percent on board with investing in the future. We're hundred percent on board. They want to expand. It's something they're going to invest in and use. We're in, but there's also a fair bit of, you know, we do invest in new technology as well. I mean, a lot of times we'll, we'll invest in practices and their testing equipment's old. We have no problem saying, hey, okay, it's time to get a new um, biometer and, you know, spending the money on those particular, those are not inexpensive, but we know that, that you know, there's, there's improved AI, there's improved throughput. There's just a lot of benefits to it. And um, we're just real pragmatic about it. We're collaborative as well. How do the uh, physicians from the independent practices collaborate? How often do you bring them together? Do you have any examples where they, collaborate or cross pollinate you gave me a couple so far like running you know advertising at, at one eye care professional's office for someone that's doing lasik surgery but as far as in investments you know do they get together with or without you periodically to talk about in you know investments the state of the art best practices strategy that would benefit the entire group collectively and or each of their own independent practice groups separately yeah there's there's social events and there's also you know we get together whether it be various committees or um ce events and things along those lines so i think there's there's a combination of both um also meetings with all the investors just to give them a state of the union of how things are going and I know on, on their own, they're getting together and talking to each other collaboratively. And some of this happens organically. Sometimes we're introducing some, hey, I'd really like you to meet Dr. So-and-so. He's a retina specialist and off they go. And so, but sometimes they just reach out unilaterally to each other. Say, hey, I know you're part of Sunvera. Um, I've got a retina patient's got this issue and the retina, you know, this just happens. So, I, you know, all the all our doctors, I, I feel, are for lack of better term, like team players because they know their investors. They want to try to make this, you know, 
a cohesive organization. But at the same token, you know, we really value everybody's independence and we're not trying to mandate or dictate where they're sending patients. We, it's all about relationships and it's all about building those connections. And so you just, it just takes time to do some of that stuff. It's not, if you try to force it, it ends up being kind of, it, it won't last. You're going to constantly have to try to force it. It needs to happen organically. Yeah. And that happens informally, as Greg said, or just informally too. I mean, I've been struck by just how, how much um, ophthalmologists talk to each other. And it could be, hey, you know, what are your thoughts on this new lens laser technology or just informally bumping into each other? So what, what Greg and I might have thought of as the water cooler talk at our old firms too is the surgery center talk when they're sharing ORs or switching out their block time as well. They might be talking, asking how things are going. And those things are great in terms of percolating ideas up to us in terms of how we can serve them. So switching gears, tell me a little bit about your investment parameters and, you know, your, what you call your first conversation priorities. And, and so when we, when we take a look at this, so we, we certainly do our, our cold outreach, but as I mentioned before, some of our best introductions are just through our current doctors who are advocating for us in some manner. Again, has a relationship as an offering that we're entering this conversation, just trying to learn, trying to collaborate, listen. If it goes somewhere, we'll certainly go down that route more formally. In terms of, of getting it to a possible deal, so let's say a doctor is, is truly interested in a deal, uh, really those, those first conversations are about what are they trying to accomplish overall for their practice? So what is a growth strategy? What's the history and what's driving um, their interest in trying to get to a deal. And we're not trying to, you know, get incredibly detailed on these things in terms of an overall strategic plan, but we try to boil it down to what are three things we can work on to help you grow your practice. Those three things might be similar to three goals that they have that they're trying to accomplish as part of the transaction, or they might be different too. So those could be things like succession planning. They could be things like, hey, I'm tr- I need help recruiting another provider. I need help on capital expenditures, whether that's equipment, physical location, um, or even you know help with IT and compliance, which is becoming ever more pervasive uh, as we move forward there, trying to ferret those things out. And once we kind of know those things and have a little bit of a grasp on, on the baseline of, of what their practice has looked like and what they want it to be in the future, then we start asking for the financials as well. And again, trying to get through that lens of first, what is the story? Is that story in the financials uh, aligning with those initial conversations? And then certainly if we want to get to underwriting a possible deal, then um, we'll get into more of the financial analysis, EBITDA, that our traditional valuation techniques as well. But overall, I mean, the, the, the best practices that we're trying to, to meet, while they might not check all these boxes, they have a good sense of where they came from, where they want to go, and what they want to accomplish in terms of the transaction in a certain period of time, we're just the linkage and the conduit and trying to facilitate those conversations. If we're a party to that as a partner moving forward, that's great. But really, again, these these folks know their practice, know their patient care, know their employees, and we're just here to listen and try to collaborate and just be honest and transparent with them in terms of what we can do. And on occasion, things that we can't do either. That's a good point. Are there common themes when you meet with a physician or all the providers in a, in a practice as to you, how you can quickly discern which doctors, providers, and, and practices will be a good fit than those that won't be? Yeah. So I, I, I would go back to even some of the introductions as well. So again, the ophthalmologists, because of their network, they know why they're referring patients to those subspecialties or just general other comprehensive trends. And usually, nine times out of 10 or probably even more than that, it's because of the patient care. They are confident that when they make that referral, the patient care is going to be right there for them as well. And we harp on this all the time. Patient care has to lead. So we'll do some work and just talking to folks of, hey, what do you think of this doctor? And are there any concerns? You know, we'll look into that. Greg and I are, are again not doctors, so we don't know some of the ins and outs of the of the technical components here as well. But again, if that part of it is there, some of these other parts will will fall out as well. So first of all and foremost, always going to be patient care. That's going to lead the conversation. And then the other parts of it too, in terms of are they in our existing markets? 
if they are in Detroit, Cleveland, and now Erie helps us out as well. Is there a subspecialty that is driving some of that referral base that is already there? So is the, does the network already exist? In terms of a deal, are we just formalizing that network because these guys are becoming financial partners under the Sunvera umbrella? Um, and then looking for a growth upside as well. So I talked about the, those overall goals. It's what are the overall goals, but what is also the timeline? So let's take succession planning, for instance, too, which can be one of the drivers that, that gets us to the table. Is the succession plan 10 to 15 years out? We got a lot more time to get providers, ramp the practice, make sure that they're they're comfortable with whoever that successor is than somebody who wants to um, ultimately retire within the next year. That's going to be a tough conversation, obviously, as a valuation impact. And you know, we can't predict if we can actually find somebody to succeed those per, those people as well. And then again, that clear vision in terms of what is the overall strategy for growth of the practice. We generally like keeping that focus on the top line growth as well. Certainly we're, you know, we look at that all the financials, so expenses can be in the conversation if needed. But really, if we're trying to grow the overall pie here, that's a much more positive conversation of, hey, how would you do this? Is it through a pro- adding a provider, a subspecialist? Is it building or buying into a surgery center as well? So one thing we haven't touched on a, a ton here as well within the eye care space in this conversation is at this point, we are really strictly focused on ophthalmology, not optometry, not retail um, contacts and, and lenses and things like that as well. And so naturally, there's a surgical component. And so if there's an interest in a surgery center as well, that's an area that we are really focused on single specialty eye surgery, and we feel like we can drive significant improvements. And then frankly, evaluating what their their leadership team is as well. So Given that we are an overall team, usually if even if it's a, a smaller doctor group as well, what does that leadership team in an office look like? So strength of the practice managers, are they bringing some of these ideas to the fore? If they are, then that is a huge indicator that we can we can partner with them and, and try to grow this practice together. So what's your process and what preparation do you encourage of sellers? I think like anything in life too, it creating some awareness and reflection about what's important to them as well. So we go back to what is our mission and what are our values as well. For a doctor really to do a great job in terms of, of deal execution and clarity around their goals, you got to know what their goals are. Goals can evolve. Life evolves. Life happens. So whenever I, we, we have those initial conversations with the doctors and are trying to ferret out what are the, the three goals in terms of growing their practice or, or um, the goals around a transaction. I always try to give them an out and say, hey, this could change over time as, as we talk more too. That's okay. But as long as you're clear with us and what changed, why it changed, um, then we have an opportunity to address it um, as things come up. At the end of the day, all that is doing is relationship building, building trust and reliability. And so we have an opportunity to, to react to that as well. Um, Along the way, so uh, if a doctor wants to explore this, what I would encourage them to do is is really get to, with the people that are important to them, and then frankly spend some time on their own too, just doing some reflection. On, again, what are their mission and values? Why did they get into this? Where are they currently spending their time? And what are their overall goals in terms of if they want to do a transaction or where they want to take their practice in the future? That in and of itself, again, doesn't have to be super lengthy. Um, can give us a framework that we can operate in and again, tell them what we can do, either by, by providing examples of what we've done in the past or what we're currently working on with some of our doctors. Or again, go back to the point of we've not done that before. Is this something that we want to partner together and explore or just not something that that we're interested in because we can't make financial sense of it? Or again, it might not, we don't feel like it's the best thing in terms of, of overall patient care. I think the, you know, the other thing I'd say is, if you said it, I apologize, but it's um, make sure you have your house in order. Um, there's a lot of diligence and some of that's just basic bookkeeping stuff, organization, um, knowing what your business is about, what contracts do you have, what arrangements do you have. You know, that stuff does matter because it'll make the process go smoother. And then if somebody does go into this process and they decide, hey, I'm going to sell my practice. Um, I'm not just saying this because you're on the call, but get a good attorney. Don't don't ask your cousin who does, 
you know, wills to look over the agreement. It really, you really want to make sure you're represented well. I think one of our, some of the most frustrating processes we go through, it's just because they're trying to, for lack of better terms, do it on the cheap or whatever. This is a big investment. They want to make sure that they're in healthcare is complicated and these transactions can be complicated. Make sure you get somebody who knows what they're doing um, as it relates to healthcare transactions. And I think it's really, really, really important. It's, um, you know, so th- that's a little bit more of the um, blocking and tackling. I mean, Mike was really hitting on the whys and I'm, I'm getting more into the what you need to do. And um, I wouldn't take the process too lightly because it's, it's complicated and it's frustrating at times as well. You have to have patience. 100%. And, and it, you know, jokingly, as, as Greg said it as well, it's not just because Ballard Spar and, and you, Jeff, are, are hosting us today too. Invest in your legal, invest in your accountant, wealth managers, all that list of advisors should be privy to this and part of part of the overall process. Because again, it's going to get tough. Now, if you can, when it gets tough and gets frustrating, if, you, if everybody involved can fall back on those goals and those values as well, that makes the process a lot easier and more palatable um, when you're stressed and, and trying to get the deal over the finish line. Well, this is, def- you know, first, likely first and likely only liquidity event for these physician practices, uh, although they have upside growth by continuing um, an ownership position with you and the growth opportunities you provide, but it's not the time to be penny wise and pound foolish. Having good advisors around those three areas you mentioned, legal, accounting, and wealth management will pay huge dividends. They'll get a better result. They'll be able to sleep better during the process because they will be able to rely on their advisors, picking up the laboring ore and a lot of things so they can continue to focus on their practice. And so that, you know, there's no degradation in the in the business itself, underlying business, while they're trying to execute a transaction. Yeah. And the other thing is I would just say is make sure you do your homework. Ask around. I mean, I always, I'd always encourage people to, you know, talk to other groups. Have at it. Talk to their friends. Talk to, talk to any of our doctors you want. You, it's a it's an open phone book. You can call any of them anytime. And every firm should, you know, every group should have that type of mentality. And then I, I touched on it earlier, and I think it does matter. If you want to go down the private equity route, you want to make sure that the private equity firm understands healthcare. I've seen many examples where it goes pear shaped. When they're in oil or they're in retail and they're saying, we can get into this healthcare thing. Seems like it's a cool thing to get into. And they, it's just, it just doesn't work really well because they don't know, they aren't able to really understand the environment and how we fit into it. And that does matter. So I think do your homework too. It's not just about the money. Yeah. I mean, obviously that's a, a huge component of it, but you know, great. You get a, you may get a turn or something more because they paid you more, but then your life is H-E double hockey sticks. And it's like, you know, it's, it's not, it really depends on where you're at. I mean, we, we I can't, I, I've definitely had conversations where I walk and I, we just meet the doctor and they'll ask us, why do you want to buy my practice? I don't know that we do, you know, and we, we need to get to know each other. And Mike is very insistent on face to face, making sure that we get to know the people, you know, we had a meeting last night and, He's had many discussions with this doctor before. And the doctor's like, well, what are we meeting for? It's like, well, we want to know you. This is a personal transaction. We don't want it to be just a bunch of paper that's passed back and forth and some dollars. And then off you go on your merry way. I mean, we want to make sure that there's alignment. You you know what, who we are. You know what we're about. We know who, who you are and what you're about and what your goals and dreams are. And sometimes what they want to do is like, we're not interested in that. You know, and we're not afraid to say, no, well, thank you. Um, so you're looking for a trusting know. long-term relationship. Yeah. Yeah. That's why you call it a partnership, I guess. True. Do you have a typical timeline from beginning conversation, first conversation to at least signing an LOI, if not closing a transaction? I wish we did so I could provide some certainty around it too, because we get also we get asked that a ton too. It, it's unique in every situation. So a, a, even bank deals might have certain timelines. Obviously, we want to get a deal done um, as efficiently as possible. The longer it, la- it lasts, the more time you're inviting. Uh, t- time can kill deals because 
you know, you're inviting more issues as they come up. Um, so yeah, I, I'd say best guess too. We, we've done things as, as short as three to four months. Um, that is burning the candle on all sides. <laughs> too. So I don't, I think if you want to do that, certainly we're available and we always tell people we'll run as fast as you want to. We've seen other deals that extend nine, 12 months for, you know, different reasons that come up, whether it's diligence or life events that happen too, that, you know, people want to, you know, take a more, uh, longer, longer pace with it as well. So, you know, we try to narrow it, but again, that goes back to, to just trying to understand where the doctor is, is coming from, who their advisors are, are and why they're driving it at a certain pace. And then, you know, Greg, Greg and I usually kind of say, we're not going anywhere. So, you know, when you say jump, we'll be ready to jump and we'll try to, um, try to accommodate those, those requests to move as fast or uh, sometimes as slow as you want as well. So you're reasonably patient, which is, is a great quality for a, a private equity investor, because obviously probably within your own sector of ophthalmology and definitely in other sectors, you mentioned private equity firms that healthcare is only one, one investment thesis that they're in, that patients doesn't usually exist. Uh, you know, they drive the timeline. And, you know, it would be unheard of to do to wait nine months to do a deal because the seller has life events or something like that. What's your website? If if someone wants more information, where do they go to get it? Pretty simple. www.sunveragroup.com. So spelled S-U-N, V as in Victor, E-R-A, group, G-R-O-U-P.com. Um, and we have some information out there, certainly about our mission values uh, but more than anything, I, I would encourage folks to to reach out to us directly. We're always happy to get on the phone. One of the great things and one of the, that that I've seen since I've joined Sunvair Group too is we just like to network too. So to the extent we can schedule something, hopefully even do it face to face, we always view that as we're going to come out of those conversations learning something, um, and that helps us every step of the way. So you know, if it does become something where we can execute a deal, that's great. But that I think we're usually an open book in terms of what we're trying to do and what we're trying to learn um, and just get a little bit better every single day. I agree with that. We, we, we view that we're part of the ophthalmology community. We're not necessarily, I mean, obviously there's a competitive aspect to it, but, you know, everybody's got their own way they do business and you can't really replicate. Them. So we're, we're, we're pretty open about things and we're always willing to talk and especially ophthalmology. It's, it's an interesting area. Well, uh, Greg, Michael, I want to thank you so much for taking the time today. This has been extremely informative for me and, and I'm sure our audience as well. Uh, for the audience, uh, today is St. Patty's Day, and it's also the second day of March Madness uh, for the men's tournament and the first day of March Madness for the w- women's tournament. So the three of us have other th- and better things to do. Thank you, everyone. Thanks again to Jeff Fickus, Greg Nodlin, and Michael Ferkovic. Make sure to visit our website, www.bowerspar.com, where you can find the latest news and guidance from our attorneys. Subscribe to the show in Apple Podcasts, Google Play, Spotify, or your favorite podcast platform. If you have any questions or suggestions for the show, please email podcast at bowerspar.com. Stay tuned for a new episode coming soon. Thank you for listening.